I'm Ziadi. I'm uh, a full-time clinical physical therapist here at Swedish Cherry Hill. Um, I work with a variety of patients, but my focus is neurological, as Dr. Chapman said, and geriatric. And in addition to my clinical work, I'm one of the sub-investigators um, on Dr. Chapman's pilot uh, looking at this neurologically controlled exoskeleton. So exoskeletons were uh, originally introduced um, in uh, military and in industry as a way to increase the body's abilities, to in, in, increase strength or endurance, make uh, different uh, motions possible. And it was quickly apparent that um, these robotic devices could have healthcare applications. So I want to tell you a little <coughs> bit about the different kinds of robotic exoskeletons that are out there. Um, the locomat is the first one that I became aware of as a physical therapist being used in rehab. And this is a passive um, robotic exoskeleton that's used with treadmill training to advance the patient's limbs. And uh, this was a huge breakthrough for physical therapy uh, when it was introduced because, as you may know, there's really three things we need to um, stimulate neuroplasticity in our neurological patient population. And one of them is focus. The patient really has to be trying to create the motion themselves. Another is challenge, and for these patients, Walking is a very significant challenge. And the third is repetition. You really need to try and try and try and try and try again to get that uh, neuroplasticity. And when the locomat was introduced, it created this ability for almost infinite repetitions. Because previously, we'd been just manually advancing a patient's limb. And after maybe three repetitions and 10-foot parallel bars, or once we got ceiling lifts and other suspension harnesses, maybe 10 or 15 minutes on the treadmill, the physical therapist would be exhausted. And so you couldn't get in that much. So this is a great advancement in repetitions. Now the question comes in is are we losing focus? How much work is the patient really having to do when they've got this passive robot? And the ability to assess that as a physical therapist is a little bit easier with a manual limb advancement because you can feel what the patient's doing and you can adjust your, um, your support in that moment, your, your, your verbal cues, your tactile cues. And while the robots do allow for some adjustment, it's just not clear whether the, the patient has as much focus involved. So uh, Christian Fazan, who was here up until recently, did a systematic review of the literature recently for spinal cord injured patients using these passive robotic devices. And what he found was that there, was, there weren't any studies that showed an improvement in gait speed compared to traditional therapy with the locomat. Uh, but when we looked at other um, outcome measures that look at endurance or functional independence, the literature was mixed. We had some studies that showed the locomat was better than traditional therapy, some showing that traditional therapy was better than the locomat, and some showing no difference. So it's, the, the literature was really not clear yet. Uh, there are also um, overground training devices. So this is an example that ESCO, um, it's made for rehab where you train overground gait. And there really isn't any literature, uh, at least that Dr. Fazan was able to find comparing this. So we don't know um, whether this might be as good as the locomat or better than the locomat. There is one big study of spinal cord injured patients that indicated that overground training might be better than treadmill training in general. So maybe an overground robot would be better than a treadmill robot, but that's just speculative. There's also robots, robotic um, exoskeletons that are primarily intended to be used in a, as an assistive device. So instead of a knee, ankle, foot orthosis or a KFO um, or two KFOs. Uh, but in all these situations, the walking cycle is initiated not by the patients trying to use their legs, trying to walk. There's no um, neurological control involved. It's passive motion. So that's where HAL is really different. So HAL stands for Human Assistive Limb. And um, I can't remember if Dr. Chapman mentioned it was developed by Dr. Sankai in Japan at, at Cyberdyne. Uh, and it's a very different device. So this is a picture from a, a demonstration of the upper limb device. And this, this gentleman, can you, you, know, you can't really see my pointer, can you? No, okay, well, the, the gentleman here has electrodes on his biceps. 
And he's not in the robot. He's separate from the robot, but uh, the electrodes are connected to the robot. So you see in the first picture, when he bends his elbow, the robot's elbow bends. And when he straightens his elbow, the robot's elbow straightens because the sensors on his biceps and his triceps are telling the robot what he's trying to do, and the robot is responding. So you know, we all understand basic neuromuscular control. The brain, uh, in a healthy individual, the brain sends signals to the spinal cord. The spinal cord, um, the signal goes down the spinal cord to the peripheral nerve and activates the muscle. And depending on the neurological insult, um, those signals at some level along the way can be impaired. But if you get something at that muscle, even if it's trace, you do need something, but if you get a weak signal at that muscle, the sensors, the electrodes, for the HAL can pick that up. And uh, that allows the sensor to, tell, to turn on the motor mm -hmm. and to help that action that the patient is trying to do. So that's wonderful, because here you've got this great feedback loop where the brain is telling the body, I want to bend my elbow. And then the robot is helping the elbow bend, and the brain is getting the feedback, yes, what I just tried to do created this movement. And so that leads to, um, so to a lot more neuroplasticity than a, a passive robot. And you still get all the benefit of being able to get so many repetitions because the robot is assisting and the therapist isn't having to do it all. And then uh, peripherally, of course, this can lead to stronger muscles and potential nerve regeneration. So this is really exciting and really, really different. Um, so, Dr. Chapman, as he said, got very excited about this. We, he, we had some really good literature coming out of um, Bochum um, indicating that chronic spinal cord injured patients could make real advancements in, uh, in their walking and standing abilities. So as he said, we all went over uh, to Bochum as a team. Um, six of us have become sub-investigators in the, the study. Um, we went over in January of 2016 and began our pilot in September. Um, the pilot's limited to 30 patients, but what's so exciting, so our pilot's main purpose is to establish safety and try to get this device FDA approved because we're the first people to have HAL in the United States. Previously, it's been used. It's actually, health insurance is covering it in Japan. Um, throughout Germany, there's these large LNI facilities that are just dedicated to HAL, so it's being used regularly in treatment of patients in other countries, but it hasn't been brought to the United States previously. So because our focus is just to establish safety, we have this wonderful opportunity to explore and take risks and bring patients in that with diagnoses that have never been tried with the HAL. So um, in addition to spinal cord injury, um, and, and there has been some work done on CVA in the past, but we're doing more work um, with brain injury, and we're also expanding to neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and so for instance, we've, we, as, as Dr. Chapman said, we have eight patients, six have completed, two are in process, and we've already had the very first patient ever to use the HAL whose primary deficits were ataxia, not weakness. So previously it had just been used on weakness. So we had no idea going in what the results might be. So it's been extremely exciting. Um, so in case you have any patients that you want to refer, I just wanted to quickly say our contraindications are just patients that can't fit into the suit, severe spasticity prevents the suit from working, or anything that injuries that we could worsen with the suit. Our indications are uh, a patient that's got functional paralysis, has some muscle strength, at least trace muscle strength, and their condition is, is stable. They're not getting right now significantly more significantly better. So um, I just wanted to, to show these pictures uh, to sort of indicate how the robot works. The top picture uh, in the left-hand corner shows placing the electrodes. So we put electrodes on the flexors and extensors at the knee and the hip. And those are the joints and that the, the robot will sense and assist with. And then we fit the robot. It's adjustable in a number of ways. And then we adjust settings. And as a therapist, I have a lot of um, flexibility with those settings. I can change how 
uh, sensitive the robot is. So how much contraction does the patient have to create before the robot can tell? I can change how, how much assistance the robot gives, how quickly that assistant comes on, and we can make changes throughout our treatment um, you know, as a treatment strategy, so doing repetitions, trying to build strength, um, and as the treatment progresses, we can decrease um, assistance as the, the patient is getting stronger. So it's really quite, it's really quite a, a fantastic system. Uh, one of the things that um, I had the opportunity to do that they haven't been doing in Bochum yet, and they have some anecdotal evidence may be effective in Japan, is I've, I had the opportunity, we enrolled a patient that was much weaker than patients that they see tr typically in Bochum, and I had the opportunity to use the HAL as a biofeedback unit. Um, we have a really nice screen um, that shows the patient what muscles they're contracting and how much. And as you probably know, a weak patient will bring in every muscle to try to, to do an action. And they can see what muscles they're contracting and try to learn to focus and individualize the contraction and create a bigger contraction on that single muscle. So it's great. So um, the group that we have seen, the first group um, consisted of a 32-year-old woman who had an acute spinal cord infarct. So that was in uh, June. And uh, she had had PT three times a week in August and September and was enrolled in our study in late September. And at the time of enrollment, she was a wheelchair user and she wasn't really able to do any kind of standing or walking. Our second subject is a 59-year-old man with relaxing remitting multiple sclerosis with a diagnosis in 1998. He was a power wheelchair user, but walked within the home with a, for with a front wheel walker and socks with it just sliding his feet <coughs> along the floor. And our third subject um, had a, a, a mengi meningioma ectomy in March um, and she was the patient who was primarily ataxic, and she was she had three months of of inpatient rehab followed by five months of PT five times a week prior to the the enrollment, and she was just being transported passively in a wheelchair at the time of enrollment. She could walk with her husband with two handhold assist five or ten feet at a time, but it was very very limited. So the, one of our main outcome measures is the 10-meter walk test. And this is where um, we look at how fast somebody can cross 10 meters and how many steps it takes. So the top graph, we're looking at um, where people started, where they were at the end of training, and where they were six months later. And uh, you can see that uh, everybody was, was uh, able to get faster. Um, Teresa, uh, sorry, the, the third subject uh, did get, did lose a little bit of her gain on the, uh, on the return. And the, the, I do think, I think there might be an error. I really apologize. I had to do this like literally right before I came. I think there's an error in the line the, on the subject too. I think that should be going in the opposite direction. So I apologize on that. The number of steps did decrease for all three patients as well. Uh, another um, a, a measure that we use is the timed up and go, where a person must start in a chair, get up, walk three meters, turn around, sit back down. And, and uh, on this measure, the subject one wasn't able to do it at all when we enrolled her. She couldn't stand up on her own. So by the time we finished the training, she was able to do that. So that's quite an accomplishment. And we want to see that time go down. And uh, subject two didn't have much of a change, but subject three had a dramatic improvement. She lost some of her gains on the six-month return, but, but not all of them. The whiskey score is a score of uh, how much assistance you need with gait. It takes into account, do, do you need physical assistance? Do you use assistive device? Do you use bracing? And um, we see an improvement on everybody's score on that one. The six minute walk test uh, tests endurance. How many meters can you walk in six minutes? Again, subject one couldn't even do this at the beginning, but was able to and continued to improve after she left the study. Um, and the other two subjects uh, improved as well. And finally, the Berg is a test of balance, a series of balance uh, activities. And subject one and, su and subject two didn't change much on the Berg, but subject three had huge improvement. And remember that she's the ataxic patient, so this is a, a massive, um, important um, 
objective measure for her. So our second cohort, which we just finished, uh, consisted of a 75-year-old man who had a stroke in 2014. Um, subject five was a 36-year-old woman with a diagnosis of transverse myelitis in 2013 and a T4 sensory level. And subject six um, has, has a neuromyelitis optica diagnosed in 2006 uh, and is a 70-year-old male. Um, the, the gentleman with the CVA had been getting quite a lot of PT. He'd been doing body weight support treadmill training four times a week when he started the study, so he's already getting a lot of treadmill training. Um, and he was walking 1,000 feet with a walker and a left AFO. Um, subject five had been getting PT once a month for two years, and she was <coughs> able to walk with a left KAFO and a front wheel walker, but uh, she, it was very fatiguing, and she got pain, so she almost never did it. She would go months without walking, uh, because she was, very, she was very capable in her manual wheelchair. And uh, subject six was a power wheelchair user. He was getting PT six times a year, and he was walking 60 feet with a front wheel walker and wheelchair follow for exercise. So you can see, again, each of these patients improved significantly on their, their speed and decreased their number of steps on the 10-meter walk. Uh, the tug gets much faster. And I want you just to, to appreciate the green line. Subject three has had such massive improvement in all the, the, um, in all the measures. Uh, the whiskey score improved for subjects five and sub, oh, sorry, did I say, say subject three? I meant subject six. Uh, the whiskey score improved for subject five and subject six. It stayed stable for the, the gentleman with the CBA. The, uh, Six-minute walk test improved for everybody. I mean, you see the, the gentleman with the CBA had the least improvement, but he did have some, which on some level is surprising given how much PT he was getting coming into the study. And uh, finally, uh, on the Berg, the gentleman with the CBA stays stable, but the other two patients have significant improvement. So I want to highlight just briefly um, subject five because we had a real opportunity with her because in 2015, she was enrolled in the rewalk study at UW, and I was able to get her um, pre and post test data from them. So she had uh, 20 sessions, 22 hour sessions over 10 weeks of rewalk training. And remember, the rewalk is the one that's meant to be worn and used as an assistive device. Um, on the 10 meter walk test, they did not do a pretest, but you can see her post test with the rewalk and the pretest with the how were about the same level. So she hadn't really changed in those couple of years on that, on gait speed, but then she had a massive improvement after working with the how. On the timed up and go test, um, she, uh, she actually was worse in her post-test with the rewalk because when they were doing their testing, the pre-test was done with her KAFO and her walker, and the post-test was done with the rewalk, and the rewalk actually slowed her down considerably. But if you look at her pre-test for the HAL, it's about the same level as her pre-test for the rewalk, so not a lot of change there, but then gets much faster after she gets the HAL treatment. On the six-minute walk test, um, she didn't have much change pre versus post with the, the rewalk, she wasn't getting quite as far by the time she came in for her house screening, because remember, she had been walking very, very little. Uh, so she had actually decreased how far she could walk in six minutes. And then she had significant improvement over her pre-rewalk um, score after HAL. So this gives us some indication, it's, it's just one person, but it gives us some indication that that neuromuscular feedback loop may be making a significant difference in, in the effectiveness of the training uh, with the HAL exoskeleton versus some of the passive exoskeletons. So in summary, the HAL is the only exoskeleton with neuromuscular feedback loop, and we're the only ones who have it in the United States. It may have a broad application to neurological diseases. We're, we're having um, very promising pilot results. But of course, we need a lot more research, and I, lo I look forward to the time when we'll be able to do crossover studies and be able to compare the HAL to other exoskeletons and to traditional therapy. Thank you.